Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to episode three of Cardinal Dash. I'm Daniel Martinez Krams, joined here by King Jemison, and we have a recruiting special here for you today. Hope you enjoy. So, question I want to lead with, King, is what is going on with Stanford's recruiting timeline? Is Stanford adjusting it all of a sudden? And I, I want to start here with a little bit of background because this has been something that's going on for, for quite some time. So Stanford has been notoriously stingy with quarterback offers. They usually only offer one per cycle with the expectation that they will sign on the dotted line, no questions. There's even a quasi requirement that they would camp at Stanford at some time. So in the 2021 cycle, upcoming cycle, four-star Miller Moss, he's visited Stanford a few times, including one time where he was next to me on the sidelines. Pretty, pretty cool guy, right? A lot of interest, and he's really good by all accounts. The four-star, right? He would have been starting at Bishop Alimany for his third straight year. But Miller never got an offer, and he chose USC. Meanwhile, Stanford offered and got a verbal commitment from three-star Ari Potu, who is, who is a good quarterback. I don't want to diminish that. He's a good quarterback. But he hasn't been a full-time starter yet. Plays at nearby Folsom. And, but for this entire process, Stanford was absolutely eviscerated by RJ Abetia on 24-7 sports at the bootleg. Absolutely eviscerated. He went down on them. He said, this is absurd. And now what we see in this last week is Stanford just offered three quarterbacks for the class of 2022. King, is Stanford finally listening to fans and pundits? Are they changing their timeline? Well, first of all, if they're listening, they're listening to RJ Abetia because he is by far the loudest voice on this topic. And a lot of today's show is going to is going to be centered around RJ's reporting. So a shout out to him. Great guy. Um, and I think, though, if you read his articles, if you follow Stanford football recruiting closely, it's hard to argue that they are not significantly shifting their timeline. And just read out some numbers for you here, Daniel. On August 3rd, 2018, for the 2020 class, Stanford has sent out 22 offers. Last year, August 5th, 2019, for the 2021 class, Stanford had sent out 14 offers. This year, for the 2022 class, in the midst of a global pandemic, by August 8th, Stanford has sent out 33 offers. So that's a significant bump. And when you talk about not getting a quarterback uh, commitment until really the the last hour when you're when you're looking at quarterbacks and the lack of availability at that position and the importance of that position. Um, that was last year. This year, we see them go the exact opposite direction with two offers within a very short time span, pretty early in the recruiting cycle. And I think it does show that Stanford, maybe they're not, I, I don't think I'd give David Shaw credit for reading uh, RJ Beatty and saying that's what we need to do. But I do think that they must have done some un internal review and realized, listen, we're falling behind. Ari Patu is a great player. We like him. We think that, that he's the guy who could eventually start here at Stanford. But we probably could have done better. We probably could have landed a bigger fish had we changed our timeline a little bit. And so I think that's what they did this year. Yeah, I mean, we just look at the past and where they had been. 2017, they offer Davis Mills and another quarterback, Davis Mills comes. But that's the only time in recent memory that they've offered two quarterbacks at all in an entire cycle. In 2018, they uh, offered both Tanner McKee and uh, as well as uh, – uh, sorry, what am I, Jack West, who actually eventually came, right? So both of them, but knowing that Tanner Murti was going to go on a mission and it'd take two years later, right? <sighs> this year, they're going and offering three. They have A.J. Duffy, Brandon, Braden Davis, and M.J. Morris. I just, it's absurd that they're finally changing. I'm very much welcoming it. Just crazy that it's finally coming about because there's a little bit of a, a, <laughs> a push and pull, right, with uh, in the past with, David Shaw on the media, a little bit abrasive at times. He knew that RJ and Jacob Rayburn, as well at Cardinal Sports Report, would go at him on a little bit of this recruiting stuff, saying, "Why aren't you going to modernize? Why aren't you going to adapt to what a lot of other uh, a lot of other schools are doing?" And now, finally, they're giving it to us in this off year, which is is ex very odd, if to say the least. But uh, they did talk about doing a lot of introspection after the season, after a really disappointing four and eight season. And uh, I'm going to use a little metaphor here, but it's kind of like a f fire swept through the forest, right? They're burning everything down. And then hopefully we got some new growth right now. And obviously uh, very apt with all the fires going on in California right now. Yeah, we have way too much experience with fires in, in the Bay Area and smoke, you know, canceling big game a couple of years ago. Um, but, you know, they always say if there's one positive of fires is that they're necessary for the growth of the forest. And the farm might have needed to burn in this case because we look at how far Stanford has fallen in recruiting. I mean, it's absurd for a school that should be able to get people on campus 
and land them in, in you know, in, in a heartbeat. You know, if you go to Stanford, this is going to sound incredibly pretentious, but it is one of the most unbelievable campuses in the world. And you have a chance to win football games. You have a chance to be a part of the best athletic department in the country. It's a total package. And yet we haven't seen the same results because other schools are working harder and they're working earlier and they're able to land these guys before Stanford is even in the door. And I think that's been a problem for a long time. Um, it's good that they're addressing it now. But to if you if you read R.J. Abatia's coverage of the Miller Moss Ari Patu situation, I think you'll be alarmed. There is some some very questionable comments by David Shaw that Abadia cites. It basically seems like David Shaw was saying that Miller Moss might provide too much competition in the QB room. And if that sounds like something you want, you're exactly right. More competition, the better. I mean, there's a reason why other schools are signing multiple potential first round NFL draft pick quarterbacks, because those guys are only going to elevate each other. And if one transfers out, it's not the end of the world because the final product is something even better. And uh, I, you know, I think David Shaw shies away from that, even though he claims to like competition. And so that's good. We got three quarterback offers out there for the 2022 class. If two of these guys come, particularly three of these guys come, it's really going to be a cutthroat QB room. And that's the kind of, of situation uh, that can breed potentially an elite signal caller. Totally agree with that. It, they need that competition, right? And, and that the transfers, which is, I think, something really unique about Stanford. This is going to sound pretentious too, but when you have – an elite school, people want to get their degree. They don't want to transfer out. Anyone who comes on at Stanford wants to stay on and get their Stanford degree. That's an important part. And there's a great football program to boot. It's a really great package. They have so much to sell when they're going out and recruiting. So why can't they start using that? And I think we're seeing that now. I'm really impressed by that because we know how much competition can do. We know that if Davis Mills is in there with Tanner McKee and then Jack West is now being pushed for, for that third starter spot by some of these freshmen, that's how it's going to start building, and this is going to become a program that is putting out another Heisman caliber quarterback like Andrew Luck. Yeah, and I do think it's worth mentioning with particularly the Miller Moss Ari Patu situation. As far as for years for this to happen, I think the 2022 class was not a bad one because Stanford's not in a horrible position moving forward. I think you don't have great depth in the QB room, but Stanford seems pretty sold on Tanner McKee. I think they should be. He seems like he's going to be a great talent. He's going to hopefully have a year uh, this spring to, to sit behind Davis Mills and see Mills succeed and then hopefully move on to the draft. Um, and after that, you know, it's going to be his program. So you would hope that the 2022 class, maybe not getting an elite guy in the room is OK, because Ari Potts is going to have time to develop behind McKee. But that also is kind of playing into Shaw's argument, which is, you know, we, we've, we've got our guys. You know, we don't, we don't need to go out and sign five five stars. You know, we'll, we'll settle for, for one five star. Um, and just fundamentally, that's not how you run a football program in this day and age. In this day and age, you get as much talent as you can into your program, and then you let that, that talent develop in what has been uh, pretty clearly a good developmental program. I think, you know, recent years it hasn't been as strong, but when you look at Stanford's track record of getting guys to NFL, definitely, definitely a place where you want to be as a quarterback. Um, and I, I think Davis Mills is going to, is going to be the next. I think KJ Casello, hopefully he'll have a season at Mississippi state. Stanford can take credit for his development. There's guys who want to follow uh, these quarterbacks on at Stanford. And, you know, I just feel like they may not have worked hard enough at the beginning with a guy like Miller Moss to land him. Yeah. Um, preparing, preparing your players for the draft is a fundamental goal. Of, of college sports overall, right? You're preparing these people. Uh, David Shaw loves to use his hashtag Stanford man. And uh, the Cal fans in the chat aren't going to like to hear this, but Stanford has done a better job than almost any other Pac-12 school at preparing, preparing their players for the draft. And I think that's really impressive. One position that they've done that really well at, as we move on to our second question, is, is tight end. And I think it's it's pretty obvious here, King, but I want to ask you, what position is Stanford the U at? You know what? I don't want to steal your thunder um, because I, I know as a biology major, uh, you're just wanting to jump in and just and just, you know, prove you're the smartest guy in the room. I'm going to give you the tight end. That is very clearly what Stanford is the U at. If, if they're the U at any position, it's tight end. But I do want to raise you a one other position that I think could contend, at least if you look at a long-term basis, for Stanford's best position in the NFL, 
and that's running back. I think when you look at Stanford's success at running back, I don't think that's going to be something that continues as this program shifts uh, towards more of a pass-happy offense. But when you look at a program that produced Bryce Love, Christian McCaffrey, Toby Gerhardt, Tyler Gaffney, Stephen Taylor. I mean, these are some of the best running backs in the Pac-12, particularly over the last decade. And, and when you look at Christian McCaffrey, he might be the best player in the NFL at this point. Bryce Love, I think, should be the starter in Washington or is certainly going to have a bigger role this year if he can stay healthy. Um, and it, it is just a position that Stanford has sent multiple guys to, to New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. And it's not a position that it, that's very easy to succeed in in today's game. And I think that part of the reason why Stanford did succeed at running back so much is because it was a focus. They focus on the offensive line. They focus on running the ball well. And that panned out with multiple electric players. And I think I mean, it really climaxed with McCaffrey and Bryce Love back to back. Um, and we'll see who's next to fill that, that void. I really do think Austin Jones is a good back who, you know, was recruited during Bryce Love's success story. Where's number 20? You know, it's, it's going to be hard to live up to the last guy to live to wear number 20, but I do think Austin Jones is going to be an all Pac-12 level player. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you there at all. I think running backs are really impressive, and they've had a great record there. They've done a lot with the O-line too, and I was looking at um, Sports Illustrated had a pretty good series where they quantified the past 10 years of positions from going from the collegiate level to the pros, and, and they saw that Stanford did pretty well. They uh, ranked 10th in all of college football at O-line. They were 10th at QB as well, and 5th at the running back, which was highest in the Pac-12. So historically, tailback U, that's been USC. And historically, there's been some other schools in the Pac-12 who maybe have had it, but I totally agree with you there. Stanford had done a great job at running back. But then we got to talk about those tight ends because, wow, have they been good. And yeah, I mean, Morgan Turner, who's, who's been the tight end coach for a lot of these, has done a, has a great job in developing all of them, recruiting them, and then and watching them go off. Zach Ertz, Kobe Fleener, Austin Hooper, Levine Toilolo, Dalton Schultz, Caden Smith, Kobe Parkinson. This is a great list of extremely talented players. And honestly, pretty impressive. I, I was just going through it. We've, I think, let Stanford drop off of our minds recently in the Pac-12. We've let them kind of slip and say, you know what, maybe they're not that team. Throughout the 2010s, this was Stanford's conference. They dominated, not only on the field, but also getting guys to the NFL. They did a great job, and I think tight end, obviously, was one position where they excelled at that. And then seeing them do what they did in the NFL, really awesome to watch. You just read off that list, and it, it blew my mind. I mean, when you just look at – at how many successful NFL tight ends spent their college years on the farm. It's truly ridiculous. And you know what? This may not be true anymore, so we need to talk about the future of tight end you. But there was a point there where I don't see if you were an elite tight, elite tight end why you would go anywhere else. Because Stanford was a place that valued you, that developed you both as a blocker and a pass catcher, um, and a place that just had such a proven track record that NFL teams are going to trust, even if your stats aren't eye-popping that you're getting the right kind of training as an NFL style tight end. And now that's one thing I worry you and I have both at times pushed for Stanford to become more of a spread team uh, to, to really rely more on their skill position talent and tight ends are a part of that. But in today's college football world, tight ends are really just big wide receivers. And I think what we're seeing is that Stanford is really emphasizing the wide receiver recruiting. I mean, you look out, there's been a number of, of those offers in that 2022 class, seven wide receivers already offered. That's significantly more than in past years. That shows that that's kind of where, where they're focusing. And at the same time, if you look at the number of tight end offers, there's been four. And none of those guys are all that close to committing to Stanford because I think if you look at it, Stanford may be kind of shifting away from tight end U, which will be a real shame because that's a position where Stanford has dominated um, that college to NFL pathway for a long time. Yeah, and I think hopefully they stick with that some of that identity. I think I really hope that. And I, you made a great point earlier I want to go back to. They trust that people out of Stanford, even despite their numbers, are ready for the next level. Colby Parkinson was just drafted in the fourth round by the Seahawks. His pass catching numbers last year were not all that impressive. But most of it, most often he was getting double teamed, triple teamed, because – Everyone knew that Stanford had this 6-7 tight end over the middle that they were going to go to quite frequently. 
And if I can cut you off for one second, and everybody knew that Stanford's play calling is so simple that that's where they wanted to go with the ball and key situations. But all right, let you continue, please. Absolutely. Um, but that they trusted that they were that Kobe Parkinson was it. And from what we saw, especially when he was next to Caden Smith, he's absolutely it. I think we're going to have to really see what Stanford puts out in the spring this year because they don't have that elite pass catcher that we've seen in past years. They do really like uh, Tucker Fisk, especially as a blocking tight end. Uh, Pritchard had a recent comment, the offensive coordinator, Tavita Pritchard, that he might be the best blocking tight end that we've seen out of Stanford, but not that same pass catching. And similar with Scooter Harrington, who's an absolute beast, but not going to be that role that Caden Smith and Colby Parkinson have been in. It's for Stanford where they're really just the focal point of the offense. So where Stanford goes in the future is going to have to do a lot with their tight ends, right? It is one position that they've excelled at. And now we see they have some people coming in. They have 2020, the freshmen coming in, Lucas Unger and Ben Yurasek, both three stars, right? But we've seen Stanford develop tight ends over the years. So wouldn't be surprised if one of those comes out and is a high NFL draft pick in the future. We'll have to see. Yeah, and, I, you know, I do think that there's something there to a different type of tight end in this particular roster. When you look at Tucker Fisk and Scooter Harrington, both of them are elite blockers. Last year, Stanford was down to six offensive linemen at one point. It was a absolute crisis, and not in the crisis in the 2020 sense. We've just elevated that term to a whole new level. But in 2019, we thought of Stanford having six offensive linemen as, as a really big deal. Um, and it, they really had to rely on those tight ends blocking, and Tucker Fisk in particular. I mean, he is an absolute beast. He can open holes um, even when you know, you're know you working with an undersized, freshman-laden offensive line. He was a guy they wanted to run behind. And I think that could continue to be true this year. Um, Stanford, as we talked about, has a lot of talent at wide receiver and a very good quarterback, at least we think a very good quarterback, to get the ball to those wide receivers. But they also are going to have a much more experienced and talented offensive line, depending on what kind of opt-outs we see from guys like Walker Little and Foster Sorrell who have an NFL career waiting for them. Because if those guys stay in it, then I think you're going to see – the chance for Stanford to use some of those patented jumbo packages where you can get Harrington and Tucker Fisk on the line. And, you know, those guys can prove that they can be NFL tight ends as well. Not so much because of what they can do as pass catchers, but as what they can do as, as small offensive linemen, as versatile offensive linemen, as eligible offensive linemen who can be decoys in the pass game and absolute monsters in the run game. And I think NFL teams will continue to look for that. NFL teams love versatility, right? They're going to need that. Stanford has done a great job. I, I just keep coming back to it. I'm, I, I'm excited to see what we get out of these tight ends. I hope that they do have those jumbo packages. I don't know what back necessarily is put in there. You know, I don't think there's a very obvious goal line back right now. I actually want to, want to get your opinion on that. Who, who do they even put in in that jumbo package? Well, Nathaniel Pete's got a little more size um, than, than Austin Jones. And I think he's shifty, but I would say that that guy – just based on build alone, has some bowling ball potential. I think that he might be, um, particularly if they're looking to use him as a complement to Austin Jones, I think we might start to see Pete as more of that goal line back, the role that Cameron Scarlett, um, the ultimate touchdown vulture uh, in Bryce Love's heyday, uh, the, the role that, that, that he was really able to excel in, um, which is the short yardage back. And I also think Nathaniel Pete can be more than that, but uh, if you look at the two, of those now rising sophomore running backs that, I mean, he is certainly um, the more powerful. And, you know, I just, I really do think that with the depth of the offensive line this year, we're going to see a little more of the old Stanford and, and we need to, because as much as we love to see them open up the offense and be a little more creative in their play calling, you still got to differentiate yourself from the rest of the PAC 12 if you want to win games. Yeah, absolutely. And they've done that. They've done that over the years. Will they do it in 2021? I don't know. I don't know. I think they will. I said they were going to go seven and three. You put them at five and five. So we'll see. We'll see when uh, when 2021 actually uh, actually comes around. And I want to come back to recruiting for this last segment. And I think this is one that we're both really interested in is the question of whether Stanford is held back at all by the recruiting standards, which I think is a really interesting question that I should pose to you. Well, I think you've got some feedback from some of the Stanford soccer coaches who have an interesting perspective on this question. Um, but it, it's a really hard one for me to accept when you look at how well Stanford is recruited in other sports. 
And yes, recruiting for other sports works differently. But if you use the example, last week we talked about volleyball, uh, one of the most successful programs at Stanford with nine national championships. They signed the number one recruiting class in the country a year ago. Um, they signed the number one recruiting class in the country a few years before that. They've been probably the best recruiting powerhouse in college volleyball. And they've done that even though the recruiting timeline is pretty early for volleyball. Like when somebody's uncommitted in their junior year, that's strange. And, and in fact, if somebody, if an elite prospect is uncommitted in their junior year in volleyball, you think they're probably going to Stanford because they're just waiting on the academics and everything uh, to pan out. And so they have to deal with those academic standards. They have to ask um, these talented players to wait, to not bite at that first good offer and instead wait for, for something even better from Stanford. And they're still able to sign elite classes. And, you know, it's really hard to buy when you see um, the contributions of many of the, the Stanford football student athletes and student athletes from many sports in the classroom. These people are incredibly smart. I don't think that that you're having to lower your standards for anyone. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just it's really hard for me to buy. To me, it seems to be an excuse for not working as hard early in the recruiting process because there are a lot of people out there who are talented enough to be a Stanford student athlete. And that term is so ironic and I hate it, but I'm using it right now because I think it does matter. And, uh, and when you look at Stanford, that is what they're trying to get is somebody who's committed in the classroom. And all the student athletes are. And so there's gotta be more out there. And you know, it's a really hard one for me to buy, but give your perspective, please. I agree with you on a lot of that. I, I really do. And I had a great conversation with Jeremy Gunn, the head coach of the men's soccer team, about how he was freaking out the first time he was like, how am I going to recruit at Stanford? How am I going to get these people who need X on the SAT and X on the ACT and need to take this number of AP classes? How am I going to do it? And he had a conversation, David Shaw. David Shaw kind of said, here, you can use this as an advantage. You say, we have all of this to offer you. We have these elite academics. We want people who care about the classroom. And that helped a lot. And I think adding on to that, what he was saying is that you get people who are really committed, who are really passionate. Right. These are people who will take the extra time uh, outside of class, out on the field. Right. Whenever they're not on the field, they're in class. They're doing the extra work. That's the kind of person you get. And Gunn was talking about how at past schools, he would have to drag people to class. He would have to do the most to make sure they can maintain eligibility. You don't get that at Stanford. So you get this elite type of person. He would even say, like, he found some recruits where, like, maybe they're spending too much time in the classroom for what he would like, right? Because at Stanford, you know, you, you need to do that a few times and you can't make practice. And so that was kind of bouncing act that there's all of this. So I, I guess to that end, you can think of academic standards as a benefit. And I think in some situations there are, but I want to look at the other side with Stanford just offered all those people for the class of 2022. I'm not sure of this and this is complete speculation, but we're not sure about the ACT, SAT for 2022. So now we're seeing maybe those requirements for standardized testing aren't playing in and Stanford all of a sudden gets to make offers to way more players. To me, that's saying that maybe in the past, the lack of offers has had to do with people they didn't think could get in based on academic merit. So now that that's open, they're able to offer three quarterbacks all of a sudden, which I'm not sure if that's the reason. I'm not trying to say it is, but now we're seeing that. And maybe, maybe that's why Stanford is finally opening up its recruiting. That is a great point. And I don't want to discredit the hard work that coaches all across Stanford athletics have to do to navigate those, those academic restrictions. I don't want to call them restrictions, but I, I think it's what makes Stanford Stanford. I just think that, that, you know, when you look at the recruiting success of other programs and you look at Stanford men's basketball, another incredibly difficult recruiting landscape, maybe even more difficult than football in men's basketball because there's just fewer prospects available. You know, they were able to sign the number five player in the class in Zaire Williams. And this is a guy that's likely to be one and done, I think. And, and those academic restrictions were not an obstacle. And that has to do with what Zaire Williams has done in the classroom. And it also has to do with the fact that there are ways um, to, to work with everybody in their situation. Maybe Zaire Williams will only be at Stanford for one year, but maybe he has the ambition to come back and finish his degree after hopefully a very successful MBA career. Um, and I think that, you know, that's the kind of person you're looking for is somebody who loves their sport, who works incredibly hard in their sport, but also works incredibly hard in the classroom. And just to talk as Stanford students for a little bit, um, one of the, the greatest parts about my Stanford experience has been 
how compared to other schools, the, the athlete population is so integrated into the student body. I mean, there were multiple athletes living on my hall freshman year because everybody is paired with a non-athlete. And that makes it so that there's not really a, a, a student and athlete divide, a NARP and an and, and athlete divide, as some people might say, like there is in other campuses where, you know, you could talk to, to many students at even some Pac-12 schools and they would say they might not know a single athlete because the athletes are doing their own thing. That's just not the case at Stanford. Um, you, you have athletes in every one of your classes usually. Um, you have athletes in every one of your dorms. And so it's such an integral part of, of Stanford student life. And that's why, you know, I, I just want to see um, them open up that opportunity to as many as possible. And I really do think, though, that the, that the testing changes that we're seeing now, they're probably going to be a long lasting part of the education system in the United States. And that's probably not going to hurt Stanford football if they have to worry a little bit less about those arbitrary um, and controversial standardized tests. Right. I mean, very few people are fans of standardized testing. Everything that's come out about them, about how predictive they actually are, how much they're just correlated with economic status, basically. And I think what we're getting at is that you have to be active as a recruiter. Zaire Williams, they got him because Jared Haas sent him a letter handwritten every single day. That's how you get recruits at that talent level. That's why it happened. And so far, the football team hasn't done that level of recruiting to our knowledge, right? Some people will say when they get their offer, yeah, I've been talking to, to Davida Pritchard uh, for once every week and Coach Schaff once every month. A lot of schools are doing it at a much higher volume. And these are people who just want to be connected to the team. They want you to see that they're going to be cared for. And I think at Stanford, everyone knows once they're going to get there, they're going to have that level of commitment, right? That's exactly what you're talking about, that athletes are so integrated. Everyone's going to support you. You're going to have all of these people from academics to counseling to everything that are on your side. But people want to see that ahead of time, right? They want to see that you've been on their side all along. So I don't think... Stanford's held back necessarily, but you just look, sometimes they'll make comments where they say out of the ESPN 300, they can only talk to 30 or 40 because of academic requirements. I don't know if that's more mental. It's like they say they come into this where they say, I'm not gonna be able to get these players. So they don't even try because you can get a person who hasn't had the greatest GPA through two seasons, right? And then say, you know what? You're gonna take these classes. You're gonna show growth. They wanna let you in, right? Admissions people do that all of the time. It's about growth. It's about your process. So if Stanford gets to them early and says, these are what you need to do, we really, really like you, and showing that you really like them, they'll be able to come. So I think there's both sides to this. I think Stanford is letting them hold them back, if that makes sense. You know what bothers me? We say we have a holistic admissions review, and yet in athletics, it's pretty clear that there are hard cut lines at standardized test scores. And that makes no sense to me at all. If you're going to say you have to get a certain GPA, you have to show – a certain amount of dedication in the classroom across a four-year high school career, sure. But if you're going to say the the standardized test that because of your rigorous practice schedule, you might have only taken once, maybe as a freshman or sophomore in high school, and that's what's going to determine whether you can come to Stanford, that's unfair. That's ridiculous. Uh, that's basically like saying, oh, no, a wide receiver, you ran 441 rather than 440. I'm sorry, we can't give you a commitment. I mean, that's just that's that's our that's our standard. And, I, you know, I think that's unfair if that's if that is the landscape that Stanford coaches are working with, um, because that does put them at a disadvantage. And that does keep talented student athletes who are willing to put in that work in the classroom from getting to Stanford. So I really want to see that holistic admissions process live up to its billing in the athletic side of things as well. But what you said about about um, the level of commitment that Stanford coaches have shown to recruits. Um, it, it's just, it's all too true. And the, the thing is aspirationally, I hate that coaches have to do this because it is an overburden on their life. And it just creates this recruiting cycle that is absolutely hectic. It's ridiculous. It's gotten to a completely outsized uh, manner across the sport. Um, and it's very frustrating to watch as a fan that now um, what these coaches have to do and what these players have to go through uh, just to find the college where they're going to go. But that's the way it is, and I think if you're going to say that you want to make the college football playoff, you have to deliver college football playoff level recruiting, and that starts with 
putting in that effort, even if it does seem a little frivolous. Totally agree. I want to end there because that was really, really well said. Thank you all for being so active in, in the comments, chatting with us. And as we, as we talk to you on this episode tree, follow us on all our socials at dash sports TV on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. for King Jamison. I'm Daniel Martinez Crams saying, see you next time on Cardinal dash.